open your copy of the Word tonight to Luke, the Gospel of Luke. As I mentioned there in the, in the prayer just a second ago, we've come down to the last two he, uh, miracles in the Gospels. And tonight we're going to go to Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. We're going to begin at verse 47. The miracle that we're looking at tonight is a miracle that happens during the arrest of of our Savior Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, so we know we've come right down to the very last hours of his life. But even the, the, the final moments of his life, Jesus was still doing the miraculous and showing how amazing he was and showing his love and his compassion. So let's take a look at it tonight. Luke 22, beginning at verse 47. I'm going to try and provide some explanation as we go tonight, okay? So the Bible says there in Luke, Luke 22, 47, that while Jesus was still speaking. Now, you say, I don't understand what was he saying during that time. Well, remember, Christ had been with his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. The, the last Passion Week, all the events of Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all of those things have played out. Christ is in Jerusalem. He's come to his last moments of his life. And he knows his hour is at hand. So the Bible says prior to this, that he takes the disciples, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane with all the twelve, then he takes the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, he instructs them to stop and to pray, and not to sleep, to stay up, to pray, to be vigilant where they are, and then the Bible says he goes a stone's throw further away to go and to pray by himself. You know, the amazing thing when you go to Israel today, you can still go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And there are still olive trees that date back to the time of Jesus Christ that you can go and touch with your hand. It's an amazing place. Just a place of solitude. They, they built a church there now. It's just a beautiful a scene. But back during the time of Christ, it was just a, 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 a garden that would have been lined with olive trees. And there he went with his disciples just to stop and pause and pray prior to his crucifixion. Now, he's come back to his disciples a couple of times, remember? Because he told them to stay up and to watch and to pray. And what did the disciples do at least a couple of times? Remember? They fell asleep. They were slumbering. Jesus comes to them and says, Could you not tarry with me one hour? Couldn't you stay up one hour? I'm about to die. I'm about to give my life for the sins of mankind. Couldn't you pray with me and stay with me and for one hour? That's a good question to Christians today. Amen? We have 24 hours of the day. Couldn't we tarry with the Lord at least for an hour, perhaps, maybe? And I'm not a legalist. I'm not trying to say that to be a follower of Christ, you have to spend an hour of, of your day in prayer, an hour of your day studying the Word. But I'm going to tell you what, it would help every one of us to tarry an hour with the Lord Jesus Christ. But the disciples slumbering, sleeping. So he says to them in verse 46, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. But while he was still speaking... While he's kind of rebuking the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, the Bible says, Behold. And by the way, here's what I want to say about that. I forgot almost to say this. Christ was still speaking when all the rest of these events unfold. So think about this. He had just come from praying, and now his enemies have come on the attack. Now, I think there's a spiritual application for us in that. Sometimes directly when you come from your time with the Lord. Sometimes when you have spent your time drawing to, trying to draw as close as you can to the Lord Jesus Christ, it's in the very next moment that Satan will try to attack you the worst. Don't just think that because I've spent my time praying and seeking the Lord that now my day is going to be a bed of roses. That's not the way life works. The truth is you and I, when we try and draw closer to Christ, we're in the crosshairs of Satan. And he's got his bullseye on us. You say, well, then I guess I don't need to get closer to the Lord because I don't want to get in Satan's crosshair. Well, the alternative is much worse, trust me. If you don't want to let God be your Lord, if you don't want to draw closer to Christ, there's a deeper spiritual problem. And one of these days when you stand in judgment before Christ, there's going to be a much greater problem that you're going to have to face at that time. It's much better for us to deal with the assault of the devil on the earth and be faithful to God and then to be in his presence forevermore in heaven. The Bible says, I consider that the present sufferings are, are light afflictions. They're just, they're very light, the Apostle Paul says. They're not worthy to be considered, to be counted with the glory that shall be revealed. 
when Jesus Christ returns. So we endure suffering for a little while, but understand, according to verse 47, sometimes when you've tried your best to draw the closest to Christ, that's when you may come under the greatest attack. But Jesus can sustain you even through that. It says, while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, a multitude, many people coming against him, a coalition coming against him. And the Bible says, he who was called Judas. You know what? What, what does the name Judas mean in our English language these days? <laughs> does it have a good connotation? You know, our, our culture is pretty biblically illiterate. I mean, would you agree with that? And I got news for you. A lot of folks in church are biblically illiterate. And I'm not trying to rebuke any of us or make us feel bad, but I'm just trying to say we don't know the Word of God sometimes as well as we ought to. But especially if there's an illiteracy of the Bible that abounds in the church, it's much, much worse in the culture. But I, even people that don't know the Bible, even people that don't read the Word of God, if you say Judas, if you call somebody a Judas, they probably know what you're talking about. This man is not famous. He is infamous because he sold out the Lord Jesus Christ for how many pieces of, of silver? 30 pieces of silver. So the one who was called Judas, one of the 12, one of the followers of Christ, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. You say, I don't understand that. Two men kissing? Well, we're in the 21st century in the United States of America. Boy, that has a totally different connotation these days, does it not? I could not believe. You know, I preached on this recently. I felt bad because I mentioned this, Jack. In, in, in a sermon recently, I think in my Thanksgiving sermon, prior to Thanksgiving, I said, what do you like to do on Thanksgiving morning? And I talk about how a lot of people like to watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I turned it on in time this year to see two lesbians kissing one another in front of Macy's store. I thought to myself, it's invaded every single element of our culture now. Things that we used to condemn, things that we did not condone because they weren't pleasing to God, now we celebrate in the public square and we wonder why the judgment of God's come to us. The Bible says, don't be deceived. God's not going to be mocked. As a man sows, he's going to reap. That's what Galatians 6, 7 says. Well, I'm not trying to preach a sermon about that. What I'm trying to say is when we read here in the Word of God that Judas drew near and, and to Jesus to kiss him, there was nothing homosexual about that. I want us to be clear about that. What we're talking about here tonight is an ancient Eastern custom that even permeates to the present day in some cultures that men in that time, we've seen people in other cultures, they might come up to one another, male or female, and they might kiss one another on the cheek. We see different cultures that do that. Well, in these days, there's several places in the New Testament where the Apostle Paul says, I want you to greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, how did this work for the early church? I don't want to get into, I'm not trying to do some kissology tonight or anything like that, but the way that this worked is that a man would, would give a holy kiss to a man. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this custom anymore. They would actually kiss one another on the lips as a gesture of, of not um, sensual love, but a brotherly love and a, a, a shalom and a blessing of peace. It was always a male to a male, a female to a female, so there'd be no appearance of impropriety. But what I'm trying to say is this was a, a, a Middle Eastern custom. This was an ancient custom where when you might come to another man, you would greet him with that sort of a, a brotherly, fraternal, holy kiss as a greeting, as a, as a welcome, as a sign of peace. And so that's what Judas, Judas takes this element, he takes this custom. But look what Jesus says to him in verse 48. He says, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? Now this fraternal kiss that I was talking about, it was supposed to be an expression of love, care, a desire for peace. Is that what Judas intends for Jesus, Jesus to have in this moment? Absolutely not. So you know what that means? That means Judas is a liar. He's a fake. He's a hypocrite. Now remember, Jesus had some strong words in Matthew 23 for people that were hypocrites. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders, whom Jesus said binded up heavy burdens for everybody else but they never lifted their own finger to try and pick one of those burdens up. And so Judas is a liar. He's a fake. 
He's a phony. You and I, I think we need to be warned by the example of Judas tonight. Sometimes if we're not careful, we can put on a facade for everybody else and our heart's not in the right place. We need to, sure that our, make, need to make sure that our actions flow out of a genuine heart. That if it looks like we're good, that in our heart we really are good. And we're not just putting on a mask and putting on a show like Judas is doing here. He had given them this sign so that they would know this is the man that you were supposed to arrest. Verse 49. So when those around him saw that what was going on, they knew what was happening. They said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Now you've got to give it to the disciples. Keep in mind that many of the Jews, they were expecting for a messianic figure to come not talking about a kingdom of peace, not talking about loving your enemy. They were expecting a Messiah who would come in wielding a sword, riding a horse, leading the troops into battle where they could be victorious on the battlefield. So perhaps these disciples thought, this is the time now. It's time for us to take up a sword and bear arms and defeat the enemies of Israel. This is the time. Now, clearly they were wrong. That's not what Christ wanted, and we'll see that here in just a moment. But you've got to give it to the disciples for this. At least they were seeking wisdom from Jesus, right? At least they wanted to know what Christ wanted them to do. You've at least got to give them credit for that. And you know, you and I today, if we're seeking wisdom from Christ, if our heart's in the right place, that's a good thing because the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to every person liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. What I'm trying to say to you is the disciples sought wisdom from Christ, and you and I stand on good ground when we do the same thing, when we seek the wisdom and the counsel of God. But look at this. Surprise, surprise. Uh, verse 50. The Bible says here that one of them was not going to wait for Jesus to answer the question. <laughs> He's like, you all could ask Jesus. Y'all could have a dialogue about what to do next. I'm going to take action. So the Bible says one of them. Anybody know who that one was? Peter. You know where the Bible says that? Now, when you read Matthew's account of this, when you read Luke's account of this, they don't give him away. They're not going to, they're not going to rat him out. But John later on, he's like, nope, it was Simon Peter. We know he was a hothead. But it was part of that passion that made him a good leader, though, right? But in this case, his passion gets the best of him. His zeal gets the best of him. So one of them, Peter, the Bible says, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Can you imagine that? Some of the commentators that I read said he missed. He was probably going for the man's head, probably going for his neck. But instead, he struck him in, instead he struck him in the ear instead. Cut off his right ear. I can't even begin to imagine the mess, the horror, the tragedy that this man must have failed. But of course the table was just set, even though Peter was totally wrong for doing this, the table had been set for a miracle of God to be done. Verse 51, Jesus answered and said, and Peter doesn't listen for this answer to the question, he's already cut a man's ear off, but here's the answer to the disciples' question. He says, permit even this. I thought to myself earlier, Brother Jack, there's a sermon in that just those two words right there, or three words. Permit even this. What does even this mean? We could preach about that for the rest of the night. Even this means betrayal. Even this means arrest. Even this means harassment. Even this means being hit in the face with a man's fist. Even this means being struck. Even this means being yelled at and cursed at. Even this includes being spat on. Even this means having a crown of thorns shoved down onto your brow, a cat of nine tails woven together, and the flesh of your back being torn off and carrying a crossbeam outside the city wall and dying for the sins of mankind on a wood, wooden, horrible, cruel cross. That's what even this means. They probably didn't understand. But Jesus says, permit even this. What he's saying is, permit me to die. Let me die. And the Bible says that he touched the man's ear and he healed him. I wonder what he did. I wonder if he just picked up the ear that was on the ground or he put it back on. 
I wonder if he just put his hand over the man where, the, where his ear had been cut off and a new one just grew. I don't know. All I know is that the man had a brand new ear because of the miracle working power of Jesus Christ. You know what? He could have just left that ear laying there. He could have left that man to suffer because he was coming to arrest the Son of God where he could have shown wrath and vengeance. Instead, he chose compassion and love and mercy. And that's the kind of Savior that we've got, church. He healed the man who came to arrest him. So all the more reason you say to yourself, well, you don't know what that person's done to me. You don't know how they harmed me. You don't know what kind of things they've said about me. You don't know what that person took from me. I don't know. But I promise you that Jesus does. And this is the same man who said, pray for your enemies, love your enemies, bless those who curse you and spitefully misuse you. Because you see, the sad truth is, Jesus practiced that in his life. He set the example now for us to, to follow. So verse 52. Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him. And that's quite a group that came to arrest Jesus, right? He says, have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? Have you come to take me by force? Have you come bearing weapons? Have you come expecting a fight? I'm not a criminal, I'm not a crook, I'm not a thief, I'm not a murderer. You don't have to come to me with weapons. When I was with you daily in the temple, you did not try to seize me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. Some of the translations say darkness shall reign. Eric says these words as he plays Jesus in our what has been our living cross, our passion play, the drama that unfolds, it's a powerful, powerful ministry. Think about the words that Jesus is saying right here. He says, look, you didn't have to come get me with weapons. You didn't have to come take me by force. Listen, it's for this reason that my Father sent me into this world. Remember when Jesus is celebrating the Last Supper with the disciples? In fact, the Last Supper happened just prior to the event that we're looking at tonight. They're in the Garden of Gethsemane, but just before they went to the Garden of Gethsemane, they were in an upper room, and they were sharing the Passover together. And Jesus says, when he comes to the cup of redemption, you see the Passover meal has three cu four cups, rather. And when they came to the third cup, Jesus said, I want you to take this cup, and I want you to understand something. This cup is my blood. This cup represents my blood, which is a new covenant it's the cup of redemption and Jesus symbolically at the Passover and now we see in this episode is willing to drink the cup of redemption and to offer his blood for the sins of mankind so he says to them you didn't have to take me by force it was for this reason that the father sent me into the world he says, you could have arrested me earlier. You could have taken me by force in the temple. You didn't do it. But this is your hour. And the power of darkness is going to reign. You know, let that be a lesson to you that there's going to be times where, you know, Jesus, the Bible says, Jesus is the light. Jesus said in John chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. And his light, his glory is always going to radiate. But there are going to be times where his glory is hidden. There's going to be time where his radiance is veiled. Remember after this that when they crucified Jesus, the Bible says they came to the ninth hour of the day. Jesus cried out to Talestai, it is finished. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Remember what the Bible says happened? There was a great storm, an earthquake raging on the earth. The glory of God veiled as darkness permeated the earth. What I'm trying to say to you is that there's going to be times in your service to God where you're on the mountaintop and everything seems to be going okay and the glory of God is obvious all around you, the favor of God, the blessing of God is obvious all around you. But then there's going to be time where you wonder, Father God, where is your light? Where's your glory? Where's your presence? Where's your comfort? Where's your radiance? Because, Father God, it seems like darkness is raining all around me right now. You know, the good news is Psalm 23 says, 
Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. For Lord, even in the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. And your rod and your staff, they're a comfort to me. By the way, do you know what the valley of the shadow of death is? If you go to Israel, some of you did, you saw this when we went to Israel. It was a road. And if my memory is correct, I think it led out towards Jericho. And it was down in a deep ravine. And the reason it's called the valley of the shadow of death is because rarely does the sun ever shine down on that road because it's a very narrow cavern and it's very deep. And so when you walk through there, the majority of the day, you're going to be in the shadows. You're going to be in the darkness. And so you know what robbers would do? They would line out upon that road. It was a dangerous highway to travel down because constantly you're going to be probably taken over by a robber. Your possessions could be stolen and maybe even perhaps your life could be taken. But Jesus uses that beautiful picture. He uses that beautiful analogy. You're walking down a dark road. There's adversity on every corner. There's risk all around you. But no matter where you go, no matter what you do, even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be there with you. And my rod and my staff, they'll comfort you. Church, what I'm trying to say to you is that if the Heavenly Father did not keep His own Son from hours of darkness, why would you and I expect that we would be kept from hours of darkness in our life? Jesus said, if they hated me, understand this, they're going to hate you. The Bible says, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. John chapter 16, verse 33. But he says, take heart, Jesus says, because I've overcome the world. You're going to have darkness. You're going to have trials. You're going to have wickedness. You're going to have tragedy that you're going to go through. But if you know Jesus, his miracle working power that puts a man's ear back on his head, is with you at every moment. And he'll sustain you. And he'll walk with you. If you'll walk with him, friend, if you'll walk with him, I promise you, he'll walk with you. And he'll provide for every need of your life. That's the kind of Savior that we serve. Amen? Isn't he good?